Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Mastering Diagnostics. I'm Brent Steckler, Technical Editor of Motor Age Magazine, and today we're going to be talking about when preliminary engine mechanical testing lets you down. So here's what I'm getting at. I always like to approach drivability concerns in a logical fashion, because as you know, when we're approaching drivability concerns, after a preliminary analysis many times leads to mechanical disassembly. And the last thing we want to do is take something apart only to find out we made a mistake, having to put it all back together and take it apart a second time or focus our efforts elsewhere, right, shooting from the hip. So if we leverage generalized testing, easy to perform tests that give us a lot of information for a little bit amount of time invested to drive our diagnosis towards more pinpointed tests. In other words, testing that's a bit more time consuming, but it gives us a lot more a lot more information about the nature of a fault. Um, it just takes more time to do. At least those tests are justified from the generalized tests we perform. Now, of course, as diagnosticians, it's ever so important that the tests, the tools we use and the tests we perform give us the information we need to make diagnostic decisions. In other words, these tests really must be reliable. And understanding the fact that all tests have limitations, we have to be aware of what those results are truly showing us. And here's the perfect example. Many of us rely on a relative compression test to infer engine mechanical health. That test works absolutely phenomenal. I've been relying on it for 15 years or more now, and it works great. However, that test itself does have a limitation. And if you find yourself crossing that limitation, the test is going to let you down, meaning the test may tell you that the engine is just fine. It didn't fail the relative compression test. But that does not mean there's not an engine mechanical fault present. It just means all cylinders load the starter similarly if it passes that test. What it truly infers is the cylinder's ability to harness and squeeze its contents. Through amperage testing or voltage drop testing across the starter circuit, as each cylinder loads the crankshaft and loads the starter, current flow momentarily increases through that starter. And that's what creates the peaks you see over here over my left shoulder. This is a relative compression test on a engine without problems. And as you can see, all the peaks are relatively similar to one another. However, this test could let you down. And let me explain. If a cylinder was low on compression, it would have less load on the starter if it was significant enough of a change, a loss, and we would see that as a lower peak. However, what if it's only a minor loss in compression, several PSI? The pressure loss may not be significant enough to hinder combustion, but the fact that the cylinder charge is moving through the cylinder and blowing out the spark could cause that misfire. This is something a relative compression test would let us down for. So we always have to keep in mind the limitations of the test we're performing. Let's talk about a case study for a minute. Let's talk about my 2006 Honda Civic. This vehicle has got nearly 280,000 miles on it. It's run great up until recently, but just recently it started running poorly, a bit rough, and it indicated one of the cylinders was not contributing the same as the rest of the cylinders, according to my misfire counters. Naturally, we're going to perform a relative compression test to infer are the cylinders contributing the same to starter load, meaning is one of them significantly lower in compression than the others. And of course, we'll see what test results are and go from there. So let's head out to the car. We're in a vehicle now. We've got the scope connected to the car. Channel one is going to be connected to our ignition command. So we have a voltage point of reference in the engine cycle. Channel 2 is going to be measuring the pulses, the cylinder contributions to the intake manifold to infer valve overlap. And channel 3 is connected to our amp probe to infer starter load, otherwise relative compression. We come over to our scope. And the first thing we're going to do is turn on channel 1, connected to our voltage trace. Channel 1, again set up for voltage. Channel 2, connected to our pulse sensor, we are going to set it up again as voltage. Channel 3 is connected to our starter amp probe. I'm going to change the time base. I want 500 milliseconds per division for our sweep. That will give us plenty of engine cycles. That will give us up to 10 engine cycles on the screen. And we are going to set up a trigger. We're going to do the falling edge because that is where the ignition coil discharges its spark, which would indicate close to top dead center. 
So now we are going to capture the data. We'll crank the engine over repeatedly and let the data buffer fill. And then we will pause the scope screen and analyze later. Let's give it a let's give it a whirl. Now what I want you to do is I want you to take notice to the cadence of the engine. You you may or may not be able to hear it. I, I'm really not sure just yet, you know, what if the microphone's gonna pick it up. But I want you to notice the cadence of the cadence of the engine, because you'll find that you're not going to hear of, uh, an audible indication that there's a problem. So let's crank the engine over and get some data on the screen. And we'll stop it and we will analyze. But what we'll do is we'll select channel 1 so we can move it up and down. And that is our point of reference. Channel 3 is our amp probe and I really don't know just yet if you can hear what I heard but everything sounds okay and the visual indication we see here is that all four cylinders are contributing to starter load about the same said another way there really isn't much difference in compression from one cylinder to the next and that's the exact point I am trying to bring about now the results of the relative compression test did not yield any conclusive evidence that one of the cylinders was significantly lower in charge than the other three said another way i don't see a compression loss through the eyes of my relative compression test however let's take a look at scan data and see if there's a little bit different story and all we really want is engine information so we'll enter the ecm so we'll look at some basic engine data and all i'm really interested in is short-term fuel trim long-term fuel trim MAP sensor voltage, and engine speed. We will see that our MAP sensor voltage is elevated. And elevated indicates to the PCM that there's an increase in engine load. So when that happens, what's the PCM going to do? It's going to deliver more fuel. But it's delivering more fuel unnecessarily. So as a result, due to our feedback system, our air fuel ratio sensor, our short term fuel trim right now is taking away about eight to almost 10% fuel. And this problem is gonna get worse as the engine begins to warm up. Now, according to the scan data we just looked at, when the vehicle was at idle and warmed up, in park with no load, I anticipated the MAP sensor signal to be somewhere between 0.85 and 0.95 volts. That is what would correlate with a MAP signal healthy for an idling engine. However, this signal was significantly elevated, meaning the PCM saw an increase in load and delivered fuel accordingly to match that load. Because the load wasn't truly there, the engine was overfueled, and through the eyes of the wide range air fuel ratio sensor, negative fuel trim occurred. We were taking fuel away to correct for that condition. So couple that information with the fact that cylinder number four is counting up misfires. It may infer that we have a breathability fault, a variation perhaps in valve duration, valve clearance. So to infer whether that may be the problem or not, we can perform something simple like a cranking vacuum test, leveraging a pressure transducer. And as we know, all four of these cylinders are engineered the same. They should contribute to the intake manifold the same, meaning they should create the same effect on the intake manifold as the other three when the engine's cranked over. So as suspected, the intake, the cranking intake vacuum trace did show contribution variations from one cylinder to the next. And leveraging the power of a second scope channel, in this case, connected to cop coil command for cylinder number one, it infers where cylinder number one top dead center occurs. I know the firing order. So knowing the cylinder position and the firing order, we can correlate each one of those vacuum pulls to a specific cylinder. Said another way, I was able to deduce quite quickly that cylinder number four our suspect cylinder, is in fact not contributing the same to the intake manifold as the other three. I highly suspect cylinder number four valve clearance is not where it should be. In fact, I think it's a bit too tight. But rather than taking the engine apart, let's go ahead and capture in-cylinder running compression and see if it shows something. Unlike a mechanical compression gauge, 
cylinder pressure measured with a pressure transducer and lacking a Schrader valve will allow us to see not only peak pressure, but air moving in and out of the cylinders. And because this pressure is graphed over time on the scope screen, we can see rapid changes in pressure inferring where valves open and close. And because a compression test on a scope screen is referenced to 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation, the elapsed time could be used to do some math to figure out when valves open. So let's head back out to the car, capture a running in-cylinder compression test, and evaluate that data to see if it infers we in fact have a valve problem. So we've got the pressure transducer installed in our suspect cylinder and we're going to capture a running waveform. Now we're going to start the vehicle and run it. Of course it's going to be misfiring because we've disabled cylinder number four but the point is we're going to be watching air moving in and out of the cylinder and how that occurs is going to affect the size and shape of the waveform and some of the characteristics that we'll talk about later on. So we'll start the car get it running adjust our time base accordingly I like our time base but I don't like our resolution so we're gonna come over here and adjust the voltage scale to make our waveform look nicely now what we'll see here is the waveform now I can go a little bit more remember we don't need to see necessarily the top of the waveform but look at these characteristics I'm really really concerned with this rounding here so what this shows is this rise it shows to me that the exhaust valve is a bit tight it's opening sooner uh, allowing preventing that 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 expansion pocket from uh, descending to the depth it is capable of so what we are going to do is adjust the valves and that is going to hopefully bring this waveform back to where it should be uh, this area here there's overlap taking place so that is the reason for our elevated map pressure which is also the reason for our over fueling and our negative trim Leveraging our measuring cursors, we can infer when valves open and close. But in this case, the fault was so significant, there was no need to even measure. The definition that we see inside the valve opening events should show a rapid change in pressure when valves open and close. But the rounded characteristic of the exhaust pocket indicated a tightness was there. The fact that that pocket was not lower than it was, it was elevated, says that that exhaust valve was also opening early. So putting the puzzle pieces together, it infers that the exhaust valve duration is too much. The valve is too tight and justifies a reason for disassembly and mechanical inspection of valve clearances. What the waveform did not show was a loss of compression. So some of you may ask why this is. Exhaust valve duration affects the quality of the charge in the cylinder. It does not affect compression unless that valve is held off its seat. The only valve that does affect compression is the intake valve. In other words, if the intake valve duration is too wide, the intake valve is held open too long, call that the trap door, and some of the compression is lost back to the intake manifold during the compression stroke. On the flip side, if the intake valve clearances are too excessive and duration is shortened, the intake valve will close sooner, trapping more air in the cylinder and increasing compression. So the entire point of this video is that tests are questions we ask of the vehicle, and the answers we get from those test results should be treated as puzzle pieces. I never hang my hat on one piece of data. Instead, I collect several pieces of data, and together they should all tell the same story. And this is how we reduce comebacks and misdiagnoses and at the same time improve our efficiency. And part of that comes to understanding test limitations. In this case, the relative compression test did not let us down, and here's what I mean by that. We recognize that the relative compression test showed no failures. But what that really means to me, because I understand the limitations of the relative compression test, that none of the cylinders showed a loss of compression. It did not tell me there was no mechanical fault present, and that's the mistake many technicians make. They overlook that data. They take it for granted that the RC test means there are no mechanical faults. I recognize that the relative compression test didn't show compression loss, but it also did not tell me that the engine was healthy. And this is where a cranking vacuum test came into play. The intake manifold pulls. It alluded to a breathability fault. 
and pinpointed the fault to be internal to cylinder number four. And that, that led me to performing an in-cylinder compression test. The logical testing, the generalized tests that are easy to perform is what led to the pinpointed testing, the point that me removing a coil and removing a spark plug and threading in a compression hose and attaching a pressure transducer and collecting, connecting a lab scope to those circuits. Uh, these all take time, but the point is this time was justified. It yielded me conclusive information inferring that the vehicle does in fact require valve adjustment. And more importantly, we should be getting paid for the tests we perform. So I would much rather get paid an hour of diagnostic time and spend 15 minutes evaluating data than an hour of diagnostic time and taking an engine apart for over an hour. Do you see where the logic comes into play? If we take the time to slow down and understand how things work, we actually speed up and we become more efficient. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Mastering Diagnostics. I'm Brandon Steckler, Tech Quitter Motor Age Magazine, and we will see you on the next video. Oh,